mate Simon Kadich. And in the back here, I've got a few caps here. Uh, we first met Qantas College against Trinity, and uh, he used to thump me all over the park there. There was a few club games as well that you used to uh, hit me over the park. Scorchers, State, Australia down here. So all these caps, uh, Cat, we've got a fair bit of history. We certainly have, mate. We go a long way back. Um, and it's amazing to think that that journey was probably, you know, started in the early 90s. Uh, and that's now, you know, nearly 30 years. So um, it's great to have those friendships along the way. and. Uh, relive all those fantastic moments moments that we shared together. Now, I just want to get one little stat in there for everyone to know before we really get into the subject of bio bubbles. Uh, we were in a, a bit of a, what would you call it? A camp or a, um, uh, what do you call that? At the start when we were just young. Academy. Academy. Yep, uh, Academy. We're both playing grey cricket as batsmen, playing state cricket as, uh, as batsmen, and they wanted us to play, bowl left arm Chinamans. And you turned out to be the better left arm test Chinaman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, I had a deep mid wicket, thankfully. He did all the. It did all the catching for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was a six for, wasn't it? Six for? Oh, mate, I got lucky that day. Oh, I tell you what, mate, you're an absolute legend. But anyway, let's get into the main point now. Everyone out there that's listening, this uh, with everything that's going on with the pandemic, the little uh, things that we're going to talk about right now might be able to help you if you have to work from home with your business and uh, uh, stuff like this. So bio bubbles, that's what we're talking about traveling around because Caddo has been coaching uh, uh, in the IPL with RCB, then went over to Manchester Originals, also commentating. Now, Cat, with all this, traveling from one place to another, what have what have been the biggest issues for you in the bio bubbles? Look, obviously the quarantine period um, has been probably the most challenging. I've done three two-week quarantines coming back to Australia um, in the last probably 12 months, starting with the first IPL um, late last year when uh, it was held in the UAE due to not being able to have it in, the, in uh, India. So that was the first one in sort of November and then uh, did another one earlier this year in 2021 after the, it got postponed sort of halfway through the tournament in, in sort of early May. Uh, and that was probably challenging because it was difficult to get back into Australia at the time, but we were very fortunate that with our exemptions, we were allowed to get back into Sydney, um, you know, almost straight after the, the IPL got um, postponed in sort of early May. So, and then having uh, the 100 start this year, it was the first time the comp started in, in sort of August 2021. There was another stint at the end of that. But I guess the tricky part was that a lot of these uh, opportunities that I agreed to were agreed to in 2019, but both RCB and uh, at Manchester in the 100. So when I was making those decisions, it was with the thought that my family uh, were going to be able to travel to both tournaments uh, and spend you know a week or two during the school holidays to be able to break the trip up, uh, particularly with the IPL being two months. And then the 100 was sort of around the time of school holidays. So we were planning a family trip and we did all that in 2019 prior to COVID happening. So the goalpost changed and uh, made it difficult because both those trips, uh, particularly this year and late last year with the IPL, um, they, the family couldn't travel. So um, they understood that and we had to just, I guess, make do as best we could, um, given it's a, a long time away. but. I think the, probably the biggest challenge is when you get home, you, you want to just want to get home and then you've got to do the two weeks in the hotel quarantine. But, you know, when you think about the bigger picture, you realise that it's the most important thing for the wider community and, and you have to do it. Um, you know, it's obviously paramount that, you know, we kept COVID uh, under wraps, particularly, you know, particularly in Australia where it was, you know, we had a pretty good run there considering um, when you compare it to other parts of the world, you know, it was, it was spreading rapidly uh, and we obviously saw that firsthand in India um, and other parts of the world. In UK, the numbers were huge. So I guess the biggest challenge was, yeah, getting through that. And I think once I realized how to deal with that, um, you know, I tried to have a routine to the day. So the big thing for me was, was keeping to that routine um, and being able to occupy my mind with either finishing off work, which was reviewing the IPL season or the 100 season, um, chatting to mates, I was very fortunate. A lot of my mates were ringing me, um, and you know, having a 20-minute, half an hour chat. So I just think that sort of routine, obviously speaking to the family, um, and then making sure that having done all that work during that two-week window, I was able to get home and then just prioritise family time and you know, help out with homeschooling or 
do your coaching for kids, um, sport, or or do the school pickups and drop offs to help out. So it was just around, yeah, trying to have that routine for two weeks. And um, yeah, I think by the, about the third time, I think I had it down pat, and and it felt like the two weeks went really quickly. Right. So you're looking after yourself mentally. What about physically? Because you weren't allowed out of your room and go to the gym. Uh, and was that the same when you went to the IPL and uh, over to England as well? You had to do a little bit of a quarantine there for a couple of days as well. Yeah. So with the IPL um, in the UAE, we had to um, quarantine for, I think it was about uh, seven days. Yep. So uh, that was the same sort of process. I had plenty of work to do leading into the tournament, um, you know, with individual player meetings and coaching meetings and all that. So. I sort of prioritised that week whilst I couldn't do anything for all the work um, and then obviously maximised my time with the family before I left. And then um, the same with the 100 uh, in England. We, were, we weren't in a bubble as such, but we our movements were pretty restricted. So we we're pretty much hotel ground because ultimately we were trying to do the right thing to make sure the tournament got up and running and um, be a success given it was you know the inaugural competition. And I think everyone managed to do that. So. That's sort of how it was structured um, yeah, prior to the tournament. Yeah, just looking at the uh, Ashes Test Series right now, um, we've got uh, Hazelwood that's just had a slight injury and he was uh, partaking in the uh, IPL and the T20 World Cup where they were under strict bubble uh, restrictions as well. Then he had to do a little bit of a quarantine when he came back. You look at the English bowlers, they look a little bit underdone uh, with, with their preparations. Out of, out of all the players, which players find it hard to get out there and start performing after being through those uh, particular restrictions of, of quarantine? Yeah, it's a good um, a good challenge for them. I think the thing that we learned, particularly earlier this year in 2021 with the IPL in India, was that you know we had a couple of players that actually contracted COVID at RCB. Um, one was Daniel Sams um, from Australia. He got it in, in transit. Um, I think going via uh, Qatar, I think it was. So that was one situation. Then we had another young Indian player, um, young Padakal, who got it as well. And I think the biggest learning from that, particularly talking to the medical staff, was that, you know, how much it knocks them around physically. So there's not only the challenge of the quarantine period, being cooped up in the room for that period of time, but there's also, you know, dealing with the physical nature of of how it's impacted on them. Um, So we were really mindful around you know, how they felt physically and, and not rush them. And, and our main priority with those two in particular and the rest of the playing group was around their mental well-being. So the cricket became secondary and we knew that obviously cricket's important, the IPL, but we also know that with a two month, you know, almost a 10 week tournament, when you add in the, the start period of the quarantine and the two week camp and stuff like that, the IPL was going to be a massive challenge and a marathon in a way. So. Our view was around making sure the players' mental health and well-being was the main priority, and we, uh, the, I guess, the the way that we backed that up was by having a, a person, um, whether you want to call it sort, sports psych or, or mental health and well-being manager. Her role was primarily that, and it was to make sure that she checked in on all the players daily. Um, if there was anyone red flagging, she was having individual meetings with them and, and just talking through the process of how they could manage any anxiety or anything around what they're experiencing, being in a, a strict bubble. So that in itself, I think was um, you know, a really smart decision that was made by our hierarchy. And I certainly um, you know, encouraged that as much as possible as head coach. In fact, it was probably my main priority as coach. And I, I think I said that to a lot of the players um, you know, before the tournament, we know they can all play. We, we trust that they're there because they're good players. But it was more around how they're going to cope um, being in these strict bubbles for a long period of time, away from family and friends. And we knew there was risks involved, um, given that there's young players that are still learning to deal with the pressures of playing at that level. Um, but that was our priority. And physically, um, you know, we we let I guess the players um, go at their own pace as well. So. You know, there were days where I said to guys, if they're not feeling 100% or they need a break because the, the conditions are challenging, um, have it rather than come and train really fresh. So we made, we gave the players a lot of, I guess, um, autonomy in making their own decisions for when and where they wanted to train. Um, and I've always been a big believer that, you know, if you do the work um, as you see fit and you can control um, and be self-sufficient for your preparations, you end up becoming a better player because you own you know, your routines and, and what's required. Um, and then as coaches, we'll step in if we think that someone's maybe 
you know, um, maybe taking the piss a little bit and not, yeah. not doing as much as they should. But yeah. uh, sorry for that term, but that's probably the only way. Well, they're slacking off, aren't they? Yeah. But um, what we found is that it was almost like that reverse psychology where, you know, you sort of less is more and then the players ultimately when you starve them of, of, of maybe training every day, when they do come, they just were super hungry and trained really, really well. So it got really good buy-in and, and you know, we were fortunate having a, a leader like Virat Kohli whose training standards are, are second to none in terms of his level of professionalism. Um, but also his understanding, he was extremely understanding given his role as Indian captain and knowing how difficult it is being on the road for nearly 12 months of the year. So he really supported that and, and you know, we were lucky as, as a support staff to have a leader like that, that that basically backed our decision making in around these bio bubbles and how we wanted to treat the players. And I guess the other thing that we did that really probably stood out now in hindsight was we, we made a decision to really encourage the players where possible to have their families with them, um, just to have that normality at night or after games or, or just even during the day because there is a lot of downtime, particularly during the IPL um, and even during the 100 as well. And that was encouraged that, you know, the players' families, um, they were able to, to have that time with them because, you know, we realised that, you know, this this job they do is, is unique in a way. They spend so much time on the road and they do miss a lot of, you know, family milestones or time with the kids. And so that was the big thing we encouraged. And I think it had a really positive influence on our group. It, it really brought the group together because, you know, there was a, a dynamic having the the partners and kids there and, and I think that really got everyone together. And actually you, you bring out two points there but the first one uh, families over there Glenn Maxwell he's uh, he's hasn't had the best of tournaments uh, throughout all his IPL career apart from one I think around about 2013 but uh, you had a chat to him before he got over there but you made sure that he had that support as well and you could really, he, really see him flourish in there so it was a good, a good move from you there. Um, Virat Kohli, how did his training standards change on that particular um, scenario? Because he's one that would love to train every day. Did he have any breaks or uh, was he just out there just pushing his body to the limit? Uh, he pushes himself to the maximum. It's unbelievable. I mean, you know, we obviously played in an era where, you know, some of the boys were renowned for being, you know, religious trainers. I mean, you were right up there. I'm not sure if you were number one, because I tell you what, like, I know you did a lot of work. But Justin Langer probably, he took it to a different level. You know, Huss obviously was an amazing trainer. I know Matty Hayden was very much, you know, a big trainer when, you know, he was, you know, doing his stuff on the beach and stuff in Stratty and all that. But, um, you know, we knew how guys trained and how professional they were. But I think Virat's taken it to a whole new level, um, particularly the work he's done in the gym. Uh, and that's something that he, you know, he doesn't, it doesn't look like he cuts any corners whatsoever. There's no stone unturned with his physical preparation. But then I think he also spends plenty of time on the mental side of things. And, and you know, he, he had his wife, Anushka, there. Um, and, and they obviously spent a lot of time together. And um, that was fantastic to see, you know, the, the, him in particular spend time with her, given how busy he is throughout um, the year with the Indian job. And, and I think the thing that stood out for me was that, you know, we tried to encourage him to, to have days off because he's got so much on his plate playing all formats for the game. And, you know, the IPL, he's a very experienced campaigner. He knows how to make runs. So if anything, we were trying to encourage him to, to freshen up when he needed to, to come into games 100% because the conditions were challenging. They were hot and humid. He has a huge amount on his plate um, and not just on the field with RCB. You know, they ask a lot of him off the field with all the commercial um, engagements and stuff like that. And, and he, he does it all, you know, um, as part of his job. So that's uh, part and parcel of, of, I guess, his, um, you know, his day-to-day -day regime. And, you know, I was, I was unbelievably impressed with um, how he goes about it. Yeah, well, the, the, just to give you a picture with that, uh, everyone out there, it's the marketing stuff as well. He's not just doing that for RCB, he's doing that for India, as well as his training, as well as his family commitments. But also on top of that, uh, the media commitments, being captain of all teams, uh, everyone wants a piece of him there. But 
What about uh, him working with the players as well? There would be a lot of pressure on him there just to make sure that all the players have... Uh, you'll be going through the game plans with the players, especially the bowlers, but he'll have to have a bit of a note on that as well. So he's, he's got that extra workload as well. Yeah, correct. There's, you know, there's a big role being a captain of an IPL franchise or an international team because there's constant meetings, there's constant decisions that have to be made around players, selections, you know, the game style, all these things. So, you know, it's time consuming. Um, and that's something that, you know, he was very good with in terms of giving us his time. Um, but we were really mindful of that and respectful of, of trying to take the load off him in that respect. So as a coaching group, you know, we tried to do a lot of the groundwork with that and then go to him with, you know, I guess a simplified version of how we wanted to go about things, whether it was the game style or whether it was the tactics or the selections. So you try to help him out as much as possible given the workload he's on. But you know, he was very giving of his time. Um, we also asked of him to, to mentor one of our younger players. Um, and he, I think he did a main, magnificent job in, in um, what he did with young Padikal. You know, he's come on in leaps and bounds in the last two years. And I think just that being able to pass on that experience of what he's learned over you know, the last decade of IPL, to be able to pass that on to a young player that's, you know, finding his feet at that level, but also potentially going to be an international player down the track. Um, I know the youngster was was thrilled to be able to be paired up with him. And, you know, these are all the things that go on behind closed doors that people don't get to see, but we witness it. And, um, you know, I've got a huge amount of respect for the way he went about things and um, you know, gave of his time to our group. Right. Um, now, just going back with uh, all the, the the help that you had with the uh, uh, with the quarantine period and with people having to uh, close up because they've contracted COVID. Uh, what was the, if you can, don't mention any names here. What was the worst issue that uh, you came across with people struggling uh, in in that environment to get through the season? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge was um, the lead into the tournament. I think once players were there and they they saw the excitement and energy in the group because IPL is obviously an exciting tournament and they all want to be part of it. There was no issues once everyone was there. I think it was the leading. So it was around the, the fact that a number of the local boys potentially had been on the road during the, the Indian domestic season. And then they were faced with the prospect of having to leave their families almost immediately and then join us for an extended camp because you know we wanted to make sure that physically and mentally they were ready for the tournament and that they needed to have um, time so they weren't rushed after doing the quarantine and that was a balancing act because you know for some of them they'd been in lockdown for potentially and i'm talking about last year when they were in lockdown for the bulk of of 2020 and then we had the tournament in, in sort of uh i think it was late september october so we made a decision that it was obviously going to be the week quarantine in, in Dubai, but then we needed to have a two-week camp to get them up and running physically because we just knew if we didn't put that time and energy into them, potentially they could break in if it was a shortened um, camp. So there was a little bit of anxiety around that three-week period on top of what is an already long tournament of eight weeks. Um, and then the potential that some of them were going straight from that IPL to Australia for uh, an international tour. And we had a number of that players in that situation at RCB. So, you know, there was some anxiety around that. Um, and I guess we just tried to explain to them the need for us to have the two week camp. And I think once they realized the structure of that camp and the fact that we we're able to train hard for a day, take a day off and split the group into two, we got a really good reward from that because we were able to have players like itching to come to training because they weren't just training back to back to back to back days for you know two weeks on end. They trained hard for a day, had a day to recover, then trained hard again, and, and we monitored that you know every day um, with the with the uh, medical team to make sure that if they were showing any signs of um, stress physically or mentally, that we backed them off and, and gave them extra time off and. And that was their, the priority was around their well-being. And I think once they got into that routine and saw how it looked, they all um, loved the program and, and commented on on that sort of um, the thought we put into it and the way we try to structure it. And yeah, you're yeah, talking about having days off. Um, how did you occupy the players in those days off? Because they weren't allowed to go out of the hotel at that stage as well. And that, that was pretty important to keep them occupied. Yeah, correct. So on those days off, I mean, 
they're a day off from cricket, I guess, in a way. That's probably what I meant to say. They yeah. still do their their rehab in the gym, which might be a you know a forty minute session with the physios and the strength trainers. Um, they might go to the pool for a, a um, you know a swim just to recover, or they might go and see the and they probably most of them would go and see the the masseur and have a rub for an hour or so. So it was it wasn't a, a full day off, but it was a day off from having to train hard. They were able to recover and do all that. And then some of those days off, potentially we tied it in with getting through some of their commercial uh, commitments so that come game time, they could prioritise, you know, going to our meetings and training for that and maybe not have the stress of being in a photo shoot for, you know, four to six hours. As you know, they go for a long time in India because of the, the requirements from the sponsors. So we tried to get a lot of that done on their days off. So it wasn't a technical true day off, but it was from a cricket sense. And, um, and then we made sure that when we did have get togethers, you know, that it was a relaxed environment. Um, and we did a few things as a group to bring everyone together at the right time. But we also allowed players to make their own decisions around when they wanted to come to the team room or not. Um, you know, there was no set rule around guys coming in to watch the IPL games as, as most teams normally do. That was left to the individual because I think everyone's different. You know, some guys do like to, to socialise, others want to spend some time by themselves in their room. So we just felt it was important that the players got to make their own decisions around that and took ownership for that rather than being told what to do all the time. And um, I think, you know, we got pretty good buy-in from all of that. What about if a person's uh, hanging in his room for a little too long? Uh, you know, you get those individuals, uh, even sometimes when we were touring and you'd have a bad day. I know that I'd sit in my room and uh, sulk a bit if I'd, I'd had a bad day because the pressure of your place in the team, you let the team down, but uh, also just going over your head what you could have done right. And the longer you think about it, the, the longer things get worse. So those people that spend too much time in their room, did you go and see them? Yeah, it's a good good um, point you make. It's it's natural. I think we've all done it where we've had a bad day and you want to sit back and reflect and and figure out what you have to do next to, to improve. And I think you know there's no player that's probably played the game that hasn't been through that process. But yeah. and that's perfectly natural. And and obviously there's going to be guys that naturally do that. I think the thing that we did was having that you know the the, the lady that helped us. And I won't use the term sports psych because that really wasn't her role as such. It was more a case of being someone as a sounding board to talk through any issues that were, any players were having. So there was ongoing discussions between her and players that wanted to talk through, you know, their, their pre-game routine and, and their thought process and how they were dealing with being in the bubble. So that was an ongoing process right throughout the tournament. And, you know, I was, I was fortunate to be privy to those, some of those conversations, but I was also, um, you know, kept at a distance because those were private conversations between her and the player and so anything that was was mentioned um, in private and didn't want to be divulged she kept to herself and I um, you know respected that and that's that was her role to primarily look after that aspect and I think you know she did a magnificent job of that um, from my perspective you know we didn't we didn't really have too many guys uh, in that situation you're talking about because we did a number of um, team things together and, and the environment we created seemed to be uh, and because the boys were playing great cricket it seemed to bring everyone together every night whether we were playing or not uh, naturally a lot of players would migrate to the team room there was lots of games that were going on um, players would watch the game that was on that night um, we had a lot of team dinners um, so inevitably there wasn't too many guys just sitting in their rooms by themselves and if they did then that was the role of, of each of us to, to try and monitor if if there'd been some signs that someone wasn't um, amongst the group as much as you know we thought would be normal. Now, uh, final question here. Um, you had a couple of players that left early in the tournament at one stage with the IPL. Um, how did? It's frustrating in one way. But uh, you have to look at the mental side of things on the other way of, of where they're going forward. Is it, it, how how did you control that emotions when you've invested in those particular players and uh, and, you, and you need them in your lineup, but all of a sudden because of the change in in the world environment, uh, they've decided just to leave a, a little earlier. Yeah, I looked at it from the perspective that you know it wasn't an easy decision for them to make because it is a great opportunity that they're obviously involved in IPL if they do really well obviously a big auction coming up and you know it's a 
financially for them, it's a huge opportunity to set themselves up. So I looked at it from the point of view, as I said before, that their mental well-being and health was the main, main priority for me as, as coach. Um, and I had that first and foremost in my mind. So as soon as those conversations were had, and, and um, I respected the fact that, you know, they came to me and told me how they were feeling. And to have that relationship with a couple of the players, you know, I felt uh, really proud of that, that, you know, they were they felt comfortable that they could come to me and, and tell me exactly how they were thinking and feeling. And as a result of that, you know, my perspective was, I totally respect your decision. I support you in the decision. And from my perspective, I gave them my blessing because I just felt that to me, their their mental um, well-being was more important than the cricket side of things. And I figured that if they needed to get home and be with their families because that's how they were feeling, then I was going to support that 100%. And I know they felt that um, and really respected that. And I think we also had that from you know the rest of the hierarchy, um, which is not an easy decision to make because maybe not everyone sees it from that same perspective. But I think when it was explained to people that you know this is really important for these individuals, you know we can't just treat everyone the same. Everyone's got a different dynamic with their family situation or how they cope with being away from home for long periods of time. So we just tried to treat it on an individual um, case by case basis. And um, I think the players involved um, really respected our, our views on that. Yeah, that's perfect. And that's the way to go about it. Exactly right. Uh, just uh, finally, anything you would change moving forward if you have to continue playing cricket in the same uh, same environment? Yeah, look, it's a tough question because ultimately, you know, we choose to do, um, whether it's playing or coaching or commentating, whatever it is, we make a decision around these jobs. The hard part is if it is your livelihood and you, you need to obviously work, then, you know, there is a sacrifice and sometimes there's a trade-off. And that's how, I guess, I've looked at it. Um, you know, there's going to be times where you trade things off with, with time away from the family, but I think it's about trying to find that right balance. And I know when I'm home, I'm home. Um, and and to me, I get great time with my family because um, I prioritise that when I'm at home. So I think, you know, it's up to the individual to make that decision and how much they're away. But I really do feel for the current players because I think if I was in their situation now, they're doing something they love and they've always dreamed of doing, but the goalposts have changed. And, you know, when they, some of them might've started five years ago, 10 years ago, some of them only just starting now, you know, they probably didn't plan to be away for 12 months of the year doing this and not being able to have their families with them. So I think it's really important the administrators and the hierarchy of all these competitions, uh, you know, allows as much as possible the, the players to have their, um, you know, normality to the way they live their lives because it, it really is important from a, a physical perspective. We've seen, you know, it's not great physically being cooped up in a room for two weeks and not being able to get out and about. You, yeah. you just don't feel great. Anyone that's done it will say the same thing. Um, so having that flexibility around these bubbles is important, but also hopefully the administrators managing the schedule as much as possible so that you know the players can um, continue to do what they love without burning out too soon. Right. Yeah. No, thanks very much, Kat. There's so many good points in there. And I think the takeaways for everyone uh, out there now, if you're in a bio bubble situation where you've got to work from home, uh, you can't get out, make sure you have a little bit of structure. And if you're finding it tough mentally, make sure you do seek a bit of help and, uh, and ring up someone because we'd rather you have that help than uh, just bottle it up and make things worse. So there's there's no shame in sort of exercising uh, exercising the help that's out there to, uh, you know, uh, put, put the words out there where you're struggling. So, and that's one thing I did with a, a period of time for a year that I was struggling with. I didn't ring anyone up. I bottled it up and things just got worse. Ended up getting divorced, lost the family and uh, nearly lost uh, everything else that I had there. So uh, if I talked to someone else earlier, I would have been right. So thanks very much, Simon, for joining me. The, uh, your phone went off about 10 minutes ago, so that's probably your boss to get down Adelaide Oval and commentate, <laughs> mate. So you're doing a good job. Uh, one of the best leaders in the world, uh, both captain, coach, as well as commentator, Simon Kadich. Thanks very much for joining me on Hog's Log. My pleasure, Hoggy. Thanks, mate. Cheers.